We're live, Doctor Doom. Here we go. Yes, finally. The rain didn't stop us. <laughs> <laughs> you can't even hear it anymore. It's like, like I said in my reply to you. If you if you look closely, you can see my employees banging pots and pans behind me. Like it doesn't really exist. There's no rain whatsoever. <laughs> That's lovely. I love it. It was crazy, man. We were talking like for those people who are just tuning in now or listening to the podcast. We were talking about this beforehand. It's like that. It's like that massive raindrops that you get in tropical places, like up north in Australia. They're huge. Sometimes, like here in Melbourne or where I grew up, even further down south in Tasmania, you can walk outside for like 10, 15 minutes and not even get wet because the rain is just like drizzle and even like the grass doesn't get watered and such. But the rain that I experienced just now here, like one of them actually knocked my eyebrow hairs in front of my eye just by hitting it. So it's like one tiny step away from hail. Very thick drops. <laughs> Exactly, thick drops. Well, we got a lot to talk about, and we already started talking pre of this recording, so we may as well take a step back. And can you, for the people watching and listening to the podcast, just tell a little bit about yourself and your history and and how you came about to be sitting in front of us today? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Doctor Doom. Um, I'm the janitor at Live. That means I do everything that's not code related, um, making sure everything is clean, all the cogs are running the way they should. Um, I have a background in competitive gaming. That's really how I got started in, in gaming in general. I used to play. I say competitive because back then there wasn't really a professional scene the way it is today. Uh, but mm. I used to compete in uh, Marvel vs. Capcom primarily, uh, but also a little bit of Street Fighter and a lot of World of Warcraft. Um, and it's in Marvel where I got the name Doctor Doom from because my main character was Doctor Doom. Um, I've been in with Live. We started Live in 2016. The idea back in the beginning was that we wanted to host a show on Twitch where we would play VR games, but we would play them competitively. We kind of wanted to show people what a future of esports could look like when everyone and their mother has VR at home. Um, yeah. And that quickly resulted in us realizing that there aren't any good tools out there for content creators to create content in the first place. Uh, so that's really what we started out. We started out as a tools provider, uh, building initially tools for content creators to create what we call uh, mixed reality capture, piggybacking off the work of Steam VR and the folks at Fantastic Contraption uh, with uh, Northway Games. Um, and then we built an SDK for developers that allowed their games to be streamed uh, through Live or with Live, or rather captured with Live. Um, and now we're uh, working on some other really cool stuff on the platform side that I think we'll get into a little bit later. But that's pretty much us. We've been live since March 2018. We've driven about a billion and a half views to our videos and our creators' videos so far. So many of our creators have gone from being really small on YouTube and Twitch to having really sizable audiences. Um, and our next step here is trying to figure out what's what's next for live streaming for us. You know, we people are now watching these videos. How do we help our creators go further and do more with those eyeballs? It's like the stock standard of of how you know they say the classic entrepreneur starts a company, right? It's like you have a problem that's paining you personally, so you go out and fix it. And now you're four you're four years into fixing it, and you're yeah, still going. Yeah, for sure. It's funny because we, when we started out, we were actually, it was kind of hard to convince people to come and change their workflow and use a new tool. And similar to developers, why would they integrate their SDK? We had no proof points. So our start was actually by streaming ourselves on Twitch. And for a while, I would say we were, for a, a couple of months at least, we were the biggest stream in VR on Twitch, which doesn't say much at the time because there were like five streamers, right? Five, maybe 10 streamers <laughs> yeah. um, with a sort of 20 people concurren concurrency on the viewership side. Um, but that was sort of the way that we got into streamers by saying, look, we have some really cool tech. We're using it ourselves because we think it's great content. Um, if you're interested, hop into our Discord, which has been a huge growth hack for us. And we should maybe talk a little bit about Discord as sort of a, yeah, a goldmine sure. for marketing. Um, and that's how we grew organically. And we've, we've spent zero dollars on marketing today. So it's all really been organic and through the community. Yeah, well, let's, let's chat about Discord. I mean, it's a pretty... It's pretty unlikely for, for traditional people, you know, I it, like even to push that further, I read an article today about how Adidas is using WhatsApp as one of its mm. main marketing tools going forward. So, yeah, let us know a bit a bit about how you use Discord and build a community. So I think one thing I don't want to do is, which I, I see a lot of people do, is sort of think back retrospectively and then make it sound like it was this planned genius idea because it wasn't. It was really more about we are on Discord as gamers and our friends are on Discord. And so let's just... Yeah. do most of our internal comms on Discord to be closer to the platform we use every day anyways. That was the initial idea. Um, so we have public channels and private channels on Discord, private for the company, public for the community. Um, mm -hmm. I think what we see with Discord is it's sort of, um, I think people nowadays kind of love micro communities because places like Facebook and Instagram are so, they're so noisy um, and they're so saturated that people are looking for a more meaningful connection. 
And Discord kind of gives you that. Discord gives you really two things. It gives you that high rate, rate, rate of in intimacy, but then it also gives you this, it makes you feel less like a company. It makes you feel like a person or like a, a group of friends. And I think that's a place where, especially corp more corporate companies, we're not very corporate at all at Live. Like we're very approachable. We're considered as um, sort of the approachable darling in the community. Um, but I think there's a place for companies to sort of lower that barrier of this is an objective company that has an official support line to something that's a little bit more human. I think that works really well for marketing nowadays because people look for that authenticity. Mm. And I guess that it also explains like, like in regards to Facebook, the rise of Facebook groups, you know, I could not talk about it too much, but I run a really large Pokemon Go Facebook group, but it's hyper specific. Like it's Pokemon Go Melbourne because, you know, if you're looking for where to catch the best Pidgey, you know, Pokemon Go Global is not going to help you because you're not in the Philippines. It's almost trying to find a place in London. But yeah, that community is so active. It's got like, you know, I don't really do much work in it anymore. It's just the moderators that, that manage that. But it's got something like, what are we at now? 34,000 members, 26,000 or 28,000 monthly active users. Wow. And it's the same thing. Like you were saying, it's they still act like a tight-knit community or even any other Facebook groups that I have. I'm in a part of a really small car club, which is just guys that like to do, you know, stupid things to stupid cars that make them barely legal um, and somehow operational but look cool <laughs> and give you street cred. And you're right. It's, it's about building like that community for a purpose, right, where, like you are saying, everything's so noisy these days that someone on Instagram might be following, you know, blue beauty vloggers, the same time they're following fitness people, the same time they're following their favorite sports person. And there's all these different kinds of information coming at them. But when they come to your discord, they know exactly who they're talking to and what they're going to be talking about. Yeah. And I think it's a problem that stream providers or platforms are going to have to face really, or at least own up to really time soon, which is you're watching shroud and he's got 30,000 people in chat how like the, the the function of chat breaks really quickly after 500 yeah. people a thousand people so if chat isn't there to facilitate communication between you and your viewers what is it there for well today it's just sort of a it's like a meme machine right it's just spam stuff in there and hope to be seen um yeah but i think like self-organization tools for viewers is going to become increasingly important um as these streamers get bigger and bigger and lack the tools to interact with their audience and it's a, I mean, just interactivity in general is a huge, huge uh, topic that we can hop into eventually. But there's a lot to, a lot of work to be done there. And by the way, the other thing that I think is really interesting is you on LinkedIn. Like when it comes to authenticity, and we see this quite often. Sometimes it's it's kind of surprising to some people why some people get more popular than others. And I feel like no matter how you turn the sandwich, it's always boils down to authenticity. And I think that's what makes you really great on LinkedIn is you not only have sort of the history to back up what you're saying, but you come at it from a very um, uh, conversational approach. I don't feel like I'm reading a blog post. I feel like I'm reading someone speak, which is really powerful. Yeah, That's yeah and I think why I reached out to you in the beginning, way back. Yeah, and, and I think like, like, first, like first off, thanks for the compliment for sure. And, and for second, I think it's a, it's kind of like projecting my own learning into things a lot of the time. Like I think, what would I want to read? And that's what I tell people. And that's why I try to take a, you know, try to post an article and just post a summary. And that's why some people say they follow me because they're like, I don't need to click on the whole article because you just tell me, you know, what I need to pay attention to. And I think it's being open and honest with yourself that you don't know everything that's happening. And yeah, like you said, just, just trying to share that information a lot of the time, which works. And I think it's, it's hard, especially in today's economy, because you don't get as much clout, you don't get as many followers and likes, but the people that you do get are much more quality. So you'll seldom see me posting those stories on LinkedIn that people do where it's like one line per paragraph kind of thing, because those are the ones that get the most engagement. But what I found, and I think, I'm pretty sure I made a video about this, that my overall reach for LinkedIn over the past two months, it's been quite significantly down on what it was the two months before that. But the quality of connections and the quality of inbounds has been has been significantly increased where people are reaching out to me. And for me, like LinkedIn serves as a revenue driver for my business and creating contacts. So by me sharing this information for free, you're able to get it back in inbounds, whether it be through potential clients or people to work with or, um, you know, founders that are looking for advice that will come to you when they're a billion dollar company for, you know, some work or when they secure funding, they come to you to do their marketing for them and things like that too. So 
it's hard. It's like I I struggle a lot and I find it really hard to play the long game, but now it's starting to pay off. And it's been the same thing for me with my podcast and the LinkedIn Lives as well. You know, talking with Nick, who's been working with me here at, at Big since uh, we renamed to, to Big Esports and, and picked up a partnership, et cetera, and hired him full time saying, do I keep doing this podcast? You know, the, the podcast gets a few hundred listens per episode and then we started doing LinkedIn Live and, you know, when that was the big thing, we were peaking at 100 concurrent, but now we're, you know, 20, 30, 15 concurrents. You know, is it worth doing? And I think the answer is yes, but you still have to convince yourself along and you need to teach yourself, like, what are the metrics that actually matter? And the metrics that matter aren't how many likes you get on a very, you know, self-serving post where every paragraph is a line and you just talk about how happy you are to be alive kind of thing. But, you know, about the 20 to 30 likes that you get on a serious post, which is giving people an update on your company, which is providing people with like inherent value or things like that. You know, sometimes I'll post something soppy like I did this morning because I've been feeling a bit burnt out. So I posted something about, hey, if anyone else is burnt out, reach out. But yeah, besides that, I, I would say that you're, you're on the money. I think, and, and they and they're, these are the kind of people that I tell other people to follow as well, like Herb May, for example. You know, I don't think you'll get anyone else as authentic as Herb May, the man who wears a backwards flat cap for 99% of the time when he's alive. I'm pretty sure he wears it while he's asleep. You know, he's, he's always going to be really open and honest in the content that he shares too. But also remembering, like someone asked the question today, you know, how do I connect with, with people? It always seems to be the minority of people are sharing information on LinkedIn, but that goes the same for every community, right? Like the minority of people have the majority of followers on, say, Twitter and such too. So you're not doing yourself a service if you're only following the people with 2 million plus followers on Twitter and trying, like you said, to talk to Shroud when he's got 15,000 concurrent people watching him where the chat's just screaming up. Sometimes it's better to literally just add people and, and reach out to them directly, you know, like you and I did together and, and strike up a chat. Yeah. I think entertainment, I, 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 unfortunately, I think you we class people like you in entertainment because it sort of follows the same distribution curve, but it's very top heavy. You get that, you know, 25 of the top streamers drive over 50% of the minutes watched on Twitch. And that's the same everywhere. Uh, top actors, top musicians, it's just, that's how, how, how groups form essentially. Mm. But yeah, mm, it's, an interesting, yeah. It's, it's, it's an interesting field. Yeah. So bef before we started, get let's get the let's get the topic back to you. <laughs> before we started this stream, I gave you a theory, and I'll, I'll give it again here live. So for me, I feel like virtual reality has been really top down, has been pushed down. So for a long time, I think about the ten series in video graphics cards when they first came out. You know, twenty sixteen or so. You know, every graphics card was VR ready. It was slapped on the box. Every power supply by Thermaltake or Corsair was VR ready, even though power supply doesn't actually process anything. For those who don't know, it literally just gives power to the other components. Every computer case, which is an empty hunk of metal, VR ready. Every laptop that has a 1070 or above VR ready. However, for me, I'm pretty. We classify myself as a pretty hardcore gamer, and a lot of my friends too. None of them actually have virtual reality headsets, bar one, maybe two out of the 20 or 30 I would call pretty good friends. So I feel like a lot of the time it's the company saying, you need, hey, gamer, you need to care about VR, you need to buy VR, but no one's been adopting VR. So what's, you know, what's what's been the, the holdup for the last four years or so that you've been professionally in the industry? Yeah, so I think one of the things you said is one of the keys, which is people seem to think, and understandably so, that the people buying VR today are the hardcore gamers. And I don't think that's true. I think the hardcore gamers still love to play their CSGO and their Fortnite, and you know, I play Path of Exile. Um, the people buying VR today are the technologists and the, the sort of the tinkerers, the people who live, love gadgets. Mm. Um, and if you look at our community, for example, it's very, very diverse. It's not, it's not very like, I wouldn't call it very typical gamer. Um, so that's one thing. I think gamers nowadays, they need something, some big IP and a lot more comfort to hop in and do um, sort of buy into VR completely. Then there's a whole range of other issues with VR, right? Like things that are just going to solve, get solved with time. Uh, one thing is comfort. I just, you know, you wear a headset for an hour and you start feeling it. Uncomfortable pressures sometimes. And, and people talk about you know, you can adjust the headset. Yes, and you can get a better headset like the Index with better face cushioning and better adjustment mechanics. Absolutely. But, you know, by and large, it's still largely uncomfortable over time. Then there's content. You know, we don't really have any big, big IP or, you know, 
games that take 30, 40 hours to play through in VR, which again, with the comfort issue, is probably not what you need or want anyways right now. And there isn't a market to sustain a big mm. multiplayer game in terms of concurrent players. So some of the games that we've seen perform the best are indie games that sort of focus on one really strong mechanic like Beat Saber. Um, Tipitat from the VR Fund, who is someone I, I encourage you guys to follow if you're interested in VR as a market, uh, he has some really insightful insights. He just released a post about uh, developers making over a million dollars selling VR games. And it's it's by and large indie games. And then it is, I think it's like 20-ish games. I'm not sure. Um, worth linking yeah, okay. at some point. I, I can find it later. Um, so there's a growing market there. And we, what we see on Steam VR um, and as a some some proxy to Oculus as well is that the graph has been kind of going up like this. Um, so we're seeing more people coming into the market. We're seeing more content developers make good IP. So Ubisoft is really invested in VR. Valve is obviously coming out with Half-Life Alex, which I think is going to be a cornerstone and I hope is going to be a cornerstone in sort of what VR can do and what kind of companies are involved in VR. Um, and then we need to give it three to five years to get to a form factor that everyone's really comfortable with. Um, that is as easy as me sitting on the PC right now and as comfortable as me sitting on the PC right now. Yeah, I think it's, I like I like what you said and you know, it rings true with a lot of other industries I've worked in before about the marketing not understanding who the who the market really is and who the end user really is. And like you were saying that, you know, for me, I come from a competitive background, so I'm very unlikely to use something like VR. I'm more likely to play Dota 2, which is a competitive game, but I play it casually, or CSGO, which which used to be the game, you know, that I last played semi-pro, you know, if you, if you will. And that makes perfect sense that, you know, you're marketing towards the hardcore gamers and throwing red or RGB LEDs and such at them, but it's really still the early adopters, the chinkerers and people that like a bit of weird stuff that will, um, yeah, ultimately pick up VR. So the, the other thing, you know, that I wanted to, to learn from you especially about is the rise of, in, and before we get into like your product specifically, but the rise of content creation in VR in general. There are, like, if, if you're doing content, especially about Beat Saber on TikTok, that's a guaranteed, I feel like it's a guaranteed twenty to 50,000 followers. Mm -hmm. If you're doing virtual reality content on YouTube, looking at a uh, YouTuber like Josh Dub, who lives in Australia, you know, he went from 300K to a million to two to three million in a period of about, I think it was somewhere between 12 to 18 months. And, you know, he was sitting pretty you know, sitting pretty at two to 300K, not seeing much growth. So, you know, that's been some massively exponential growth. You've been seeing VR chat has been huge for relaunching people like um, Hey I'm B, for example, another awesome Aussie content creator who was, you know, feeling pretty stuck at, at, a, at you know, 700,000, but now all of a sudden, you know, exploding too. So does is that because of the content that's available? Say Beat Saber VR chat, which I mentioned, is that because of the creators themselves like b or josh Dub being awesome or is there something else in play or a mixture hmm. so i think it's taking a step back a content creator's job is to drive eyeballs and it's easier to drive eyeballs when you're creating content around something not everyone else is creating content around otherwise you're sort of fighting for the same eyeballs in a way which is why it's so hard mm -hmm. to break through on twitch as a fortnite streamer today right yeah um, so in the beginning, I think companies, or sorry, people streaming games like Beat Saber or creating content around games like Beat Saber saw a lot of early growth. Uh, one of our first users, our very, very first email submission, RageSack, um, is now one of the biggest VR creators and streamers. Um, and he was the one who uh, he built, he, he, he created the Darth Maul mod, I guess. So he was the right. first guy to glue two controllers together and do it on stream and drew mm -hmm. giant audiences to his to his work and has spawned a bunch of people doing it now too. Um, so I think when it comes to it today, Josh Dub gets views because he's just hilarious. And he's found a, a, a band of pirates that do it with him that are all hilarious, like Rekid. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's less about VR and more about him as a creator. And I think Nacy is the, uh, another Australian lady who streams Beat Saber, who's huge on TikTok. For her, it's just really high production, and she has a very specific look. So it's, it's easier to spot her in the crowd with her purple hair mm -hmm. and very specific stream setup. Um, so I think it's more about the creator nowadays than it is about the game. Um, I also think as more people come in to play VR, they'll open their eyes up for VR content. For example, I tend to watch games that I've played or play. Um, so I like mm -hmm. to watch Dota 2 and League. I also like to watch competitive shooters because that's sort of my background. And of course, Street Fighter tournaments. 
um, I don't really go and watch games that I haven't really had my hands on. Um, so that's going to improve with time. And then I also I think there's something to be said about changing the consumption experience for viewers. So, you know, we're kind of used to going to a stream and watching a stream. Uh, but the question we've asked ourselves since last year is, what about if that isn't the final goal? What if going to just watch a stream isn't the best experience you can have? Uh, in other words, what if you can impact the stream? What if you can inter interact in the stream, participate in the stream, um, mm. or just sort of mess with your favorite streamer in funny ways that is sort of content creation in and of itself because you're getting people to react. And that's always really, it's, it's always a really big dopamine hit for people who watch their favorite streamers. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess that's, I mean, it's a perfect segue. It's a perfect segue into your company. It was right? intentional. And, <laughs> <laughs> perfect. <laughs> you got that real Dr. Doom going on now. That's so, right. like, and, you know, this is, once again, this is the thing I ran over with you that, that was a theory that I would love to lead into to a long conversation from you about, you know, how your company works and, and why and what value you provide. But there's been an unlimited amount of companies who've come to me in LinkedIn, people wanting to start startups and they're starting platforms which are requiring people to leave what they're currently doing or change their habits in, in a rather significant way, whether that's a social media platform or something else, social media being the most common. What I like about you and, and what you guys are doing and what I'm suggesting a lot of these platforms to do is be what I guess I could call a plug-in company, which means that nobody's required to leave what they're currently doing or alter in a large way to use your product or service. So, and, and everybody who's using it gets value throughout the chain. So for you, the streamer, it makes sense for them to use it because it not only allows them to stream or create content effectively within virtual reality, it also allows them to be more connected to their audience. It makes sense for the game developer to be happy with you guys because you're bringing more eyeballs to their game, more people to purchase. It makes sense to me for the virtual reality headset creators to be interested in your company because you're driving more people ultimately to purchase. And it also makes sense for the end user to be involved because they are actively able to get engaged. And then it makes sense for Twitch TV or YouTube or any other content service because, like you said, it's something different than Fortnite. It's adding something else. So for you, it's not requiring people to leave what they're currently doing and sign up and only stream on Live TV or, deact or you know, essentially deactivate their Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever else account to you know pay attention to you um and an article i posted today showed that the average um the average millennial has 9.8 9.5 to 9.8 total social media accounts so maybe they don't want another one so i'd love to to learn a bit from you about you know how you decided to sit there in that value chain are you looking to change in the future you know add any more services are you looking to compete with youtube or twitch and host your own content like like how does that work yeah this is a really big topic. Um, I think the best way to break it down is to start thinking a little bit about what are you trying to do, right? So, so first things actually, we're talking about platforms, if you want to build a platform with multiple stakeholders like we have, we have essentially three stakeholders, developers, streamers, and viewers. Um, generally speaking, you need to have a sustain, you need to have sustainable access or almost a competitive access to one of those stakeholders. In other words, you need to really, really help one stakeholder. Um, mm. And that's a really good framework because the way we've always approached it before we even had ambitions to being a company is how do we help streamers make content? And that's a really good place to be in because you're adding value from day one. And I think that's where plugin companies or as we call it, tools companies really uh, thrive is there is sort of a, a loop between you and your user where, you're, where people are happy with you, to put it simply. And people are happy they tend to talk about you. I only talk about you more people join. Um, <clears throat> so in our case, that's always been streamers. We always ask ourselves for every feature and every large project that we think about, we always ask ourselves, does this help our streamers? Um, in, a, in a monetary way, we ask, are streamers making more money? And from a product perspective, that looks like, are we increasing engagement or eyeballs for viewers or for streamers? And if the answer is yes, then it's generally a good idea for us. So on that note, you know, we've spent the last three and a half years building tools for streamers and building tools for developers. Developers now come to live because they know it's a sure-proof way to drive more eyeballs, like you said, and there's that small chance of going super viral, uh, like Beat Saber did. Streamers come to us because it just creates a better streaming experience for their viewers. And you froze. Oh, you're back. Never mind. Perfect. Um, so streamers come to us because they know they can create better content yeah, with Live, and as problem. a result, drive more eyeballs to their streamers. 
Um, and then on the viewer side, what we've done so far is said, hey, go to Twitch or go to YouTube and watch these videos and you'll see something you haven't seen before. And sometime mid last year, we asked ourselves, now that our streamers have you know tens of thousands of people watching them, sometimes millions of people on YouTube um, and, and tens of streamers, ten, tens of thousands on Twitch, what's the next step for us? So you have a bunch of eyeballs. It's thanks to Live that you have all these eyeballs. What can we now do to help you drive more revenue from your viewers as they're watching you in real time? And that takes us back to uh, when we were streamers, we used to always think about it as we'd love to have more ways to interact with our streamer, uh, with our viewers in real time. And, and if you look at some of the most innovative streamers, I mean, I love Sushi Dragon is amazing. If you guys haven't seen Sushi Dragon, he's basically macroed 140 keys to his body with like uh, Velcro and he's just real time wow. doing a show. Um, another guy that I love, one of my favorite streamers is Mr. Lama SC, who is a Diablo 2 streamer, one of the world's best Diablo 2 speedrunners. And he has something that he does once a month called Man vs. Stream, where once a month he's built up essentially a little plugin for Diablo 2 with his mods, where viewers can donate money and impact the stream in one way or the other. So for example, you can donate $5 and he might have to wear an oven mitt on one hand to play, or he might have to flip his keyboard around or he might dim the screen, all kinds of fun ways to sort of mess with your favorite streamer. And mm. I think that's really, uh, for what, what it's worth, what he sees is during that day in the month, he makes more revenue than he does all month from subscriptions and donations. So people yeah. are yearning for ways to interact with their favorite streamer. And our mm. intuition was if we give people ways to interact with their favorite streamer in real time on the live stream, will they use it? You know, our gut said yes, but we had no proof on it. So we ran two experiments with Beat Saber. This was in August 2018. The first experiment was called Beat Bits, which was if you donate a certain amount of bits, we'll take the name of the donator, a bunch of visual effects and particle effects, and put them inside Beat Saber cubes. So when the streamer slices the cubes, the name of the donator pops up with like really cool uh, effects. So that's sort of a, a visual dopamine way of rewarding people for doing what they're already doing, which is donating bits. Mm -hmm. um, and the other one we did was Beat Bombs, which was if you go into a Beat Saber stream using Live and you type exclamation mark bomb, then we'll replace a Beat Saber cube with a Beat Saber bomb. It's sort of a pay to troll system without payment, just to see how people would react to it. And people love it. And in 120 days, our streamers were making seven times more revenue per minute from donations alone, not counting extra subs and, and followers. In other words, give people more ways to interact and they will use them. And if it's something that hinders the streamer, it's okay as long as you're getting paid. In other words, if you're not getting paid, it's griefing. If you're getting paid, it's fun. Yeah, and, and it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. And I guess, you know, I guess it makes perfect sense what you were saying is that there's like like breaking it down and, and repeating part of what you're saying is there's three major stakeholders that are in play here, which is the developer, game developer, slash publisher, the streamer, and the viewer. And you're always asking yourself, who's the champion of that and who am I providing the most value to, which is the streamer, and making sure that you keep them happy throughout the whole process. And I think even taking like a real big step back, and, and this is something that brought up in Seth Godin's book, who's a kind of a god when it comes to marketing. You know, I just listened to his book on Audible, his latest one recently, talking about how so many people are so – this happens a lot in esports too. So many people are so captivated about their millionth fan and, you know, the millionth person who's going to like their product and become involved, and they're not worrying about the first five or the first mm -hmm. 50. And I think that's one thing that through that discussion that you just went through is exactly what you guys have done, is you've said, you know, who are our first streamers that are using the platform? How can we make them the most excited to bring in others and to bring in viewers? And how can we test things to ensure that they get the most value out of what we're doing? And it seems like it's an absolute no-brainer then for them to use your product. You know, it's, it provides them with more revenue, like you said, seven times more revenue up to. Um, it provides them with a better experience for the viewers, so likely to get more followers and such. And it provides them with a way to make alternate content that they're not fighting against all of the Fortnite or Overwatch or, you know, Counter-Strike streamers that exist in the current market right now. So what what are the gaps? What are you, what are you working on? What are you trying to fix? Because, you know, no, no company is ever solved and no company ever has enough talent to go around so yes i mean especially the talent side you know this because we came to you to see if we could hire more people uh which yeah. by the way i encourage you guys to talk to chris uh you guys have a really cool organization <laughs> set up there um he hasn't paid me i promise i'm just saying because it's true <laughs> um, not yet not, not yet, yet exactly so uh, where's the gaps there's a bunch of gaps right like the there's so much work to be done when it comes to live streaming and i think 
I think one thing that's really important to say is if you want people to switch to your platform, what you have to provide is meaningfully better. There's a saying out there, 10 times better. If it's not 10 times better, if it's just marginally better, people won't switch even if it is better. Um, so a good example is this caffeine or mixer. They're struggling because why would you switch to caffeine um, yeah. if you're already on Twitch? It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't matter if you have more lower latency or it's easier to get set up. I already have a workflow as a streamer. I don't need to switch, which for what it's worth, is also why we don't want to replace OBS for now because you already have OBS. We don't, we don't need to redo OBS. We can let you use it for now. Now, where does it lack? So in order to answer that, I want to take a little step back, which is to think a little bit about where Twitch is and where Twitch came from. So a lot of the people watching this will probably know this intimately, but to give a quick recap, Twitch started out as Justin TV back in 2006. It was Justin Khan, who I spoke to recently, actually. It was a really interesting conversation. But it was Justin yes. Khan with a bunch of modems in his backpack and a camera strapped to his forehead. And the novelty, the innovation was, I can sit at home and watch his screen while he's coding. And that's been largely the experience for me as a viewer for 14 years. And we're in 2020 now. 2020? 2020, yes. We're 2020. Yeah. Um, and it's been 14 years, and I go on Twitch today, and I am watching a passive stream. And what we realized when we ran our interact interaction experiments is there's really two things missing. One is a platform that's built around interactivity. Not mm -hmm. shallow interactivity like paying some currency to slap a sticker on the screen, but interactivity a la Hunger Games, where you're really less watching a live stream and you're watching a live game show and the streamer is the tribute yeah. he or she is the host of the show and the viewers are the people at home impacting the show really meaningfully and in order to do that really well i think you need to approach the consumption side kind of like people approach games today in other words you're really not building a live streaming site you're building a game we kind of think of it as building a large-scale mmo for live gaming spectatorship and so the question really then becomes, what are the aspects of games that we love that lack in live gaming spectatorship today? Well, one of those things is progression. To quote EA, you need a sense of pride and accomplishment when you're playing a game. In other words, you need to be able to, if I am Chris's super fan and I've spent hours on end interacting and watching you, I should look like a super fan. I should feel like a super fan. And most importantly, everyone else should be able to tell that I'm a super fan. So mm. that's one big aspect. The other one is finding out the ways where interactivity doesn't impact gameplay necessarily, so through cosmetics. So one thing I wish I could show on stream right now is uh, using Lyft technology, you can actually overlay assets on top of the streamer in ways that almost look like it's um, like armor. So I can put a helmet on you, I can put shoulder pads on you, I can put fly flaming fire effects around your hands. And it's all like really high fidelity AR filters almost, just in 3D space. Uh, and so one of the things we're doing there is allowing viewers to activate assets on top of their streamers and down the line, allowing brands to activate assets on top of their streamers. As an example, if you're uh, Red Bull and you want to reach the Gen Z audience that's downstream of Chris's stream, well, you would go to one of our streamers, you'd give them a bounty and say, if you were a digital Red Bull backpack on your stream for 10,000 hours, then we'll pay X, Y, or Z, right? Um, and that's sort of a non-intrusive way of doing what I think sort of experiential activations for brands in streams themselves, in world. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last thing is, if you are giving people a place to go to interact, the, the interactions themselves have to be juicy and rich. So you don't go to a game today and you press a button and nothing happens. You know, there's visual feedback, there's button mechanics, there is state changes, there is visuals and audio. There's all that stuff that we expect from games that we haven't quite applied to the platform side of things. And I think that's where we really want to come in. We want to take the tools that we've built, which is capturing and creation tools for streamers, developer tools for developers. And now we want to build a platform on top that allows viewers to meaningfully interact with those two stakeholders that we've already helped out. And I think that's where Liv is going for 2020 onwards. I say, like, I know that's where we're going. we will just have to <laughs> see what the form factor looks like once we get there by the end of this year. The Jana has spoken. There you go. That, we'll see. Yeah, look, as as with many of the other stuff that, that we've talked about, I like it. And it, it makes perfect sense to me about allowing people to become truly involved in what's going on. And like you were saying, that in the past it's been either you're fighting through the chat, that Shroud, we'll use him as an example again, will hopefully read your message, then you're donating $5 to 
to read out a text to speech on stream that comes up as a as a gif of some sort of graphic hoping that he'll read it or you're trying to pay for a vip to go to a meetup or something like that but still you're not you're not you're not really you're not fully interacting right you're just begging for this person's attention the whole time and it makes sense that you know maybe you should be properly involved there's actually an app that um shaggery who's probably watching this or will be later um in, from an investment and management company called cred and he he tagged me on twitter the other day that just shut down it was called hq and it was by one of the founders of vine and oh yeah they just shut down what, yesterday yeah yeah and and a lot of what you're saying seemed to be perfect aligned with this app and i'm not exactly sure why it shut down but for those people who are watching essentially it's a game show on your phone and everybody can play so they have a live host just like any game show does it goes live at a particular time just like any game show does except instead of you yelling at the people on the screen about wheel of fortune and or deal or no deal telling people to take or or leave it you can actually do it yourself on your phone live and feel like you're part of that and actually win money you know for participating and that makes perfect sense, you know, to get people actively involved. I've, I've seen a few startups too that are trying to do ones where you can uh, participate in sport and help to change things that are happening on the field. Um, one of my good friends, Carl Flores, one of the co-founders of Unicorn, you know, founded yep. uh, even a bingo um, company and app before as well where you could go to a Counter-Strike tournament and as things happen, you could tick off on your bingo and win prizes. Mm -hmm. They've got some other cool stuff coming too around interactivity that I don't, I don't think I can say, but a lot of it, and that seems to be like a, a quite a common thread and a common trend for me that seems to make perfect sense. And, you know, I'm kind of repeating back really with, with you know, alternate examples to exactly what you said, but getting people actively involved in what they're watching. You know, we've seen the beginnings of that with people donating money to get attention and such. But I think that, you know, it makes perfect sense to me that these are the next steps. And for me, when I joined Nacy's stream, before I knew anything about you, before I really knew anything about Beat Saber, because I've been friends with Nacy for a while, and I saw that you could type exclamation mark bomb in stream, and I could send a literal bomb to her in the game that if she hit it would, you know, deduct points. That was that was mind blowing for me. I was like, what the hell? Like I, as a person, can actually interact in the game, and you know, help something, you know, take place. Yeah, there's a couple of companies like HQ. There's a company called Ripcord, Ripcord of TV that do exactly the same thing. I think yeah, one okay. of the one of the big concerns that happens when you let people win games is you get what we call financial speculators, people who are trying to win the money as opposed to play the game. Yeah. Um, and so you, you, you know, quickly for H2 what happened was your average payouts ended up being a couple of cents every game because you got a bunch of cheaters in there. Um, so right. you have two people sitting, one is Googling, the other person is playing, right? Um, it's it's yeah. really hard, easy to hack it once you have money in there. Um, mm. So that's one of the concerns. The other one, that, one of the one worth looking at is life penalty. Um, they take uh, people, at, there's, a, there's a real goalkeeper in front of a real goal with a big screen behind it. And then people at home, for every shot that a machine takes, this is a custom built machine that shoots balls. Everyone gets to vote where the ball should go. And then it takes a, a average vector of, that, of those positions and it shoots right, the right. ball there. And then it tells you who was like the best vote. It's super smart, right? I think we're not unique in, I think everyone who spent time watching live streams has to a certain extent felt this a little bit. So we're not we're not unique in our insights. I think what we're really gonna show people how to do it is on the execution side, and then providing a platform for everyone who wants to build interactive games to do it in a way that actually is is meaningful for the viewers, in a way that's fun to play around with. Um, and then one thing worth mentioning is we're never ever gonna tell our streams not stream anywhere else. Um, I think what we are doing is not really competing with Twitch, it's more providing a completely different experience. So if you want to just stream mm -hmm. on Twitch and use some of our cosmetic stuff, cool, do it. You'll still make more money. We'll still be able to make money from it. But if you want to host a custom game show with high production value, then you come to live and we set it up with you. So it make you know, w one of the other things that makes sense that came out in our first meeting together was that a lot of problem that all these esports companies are having so far who are making any sort of product is, is onboarding users. And then after that, they have a problem with stickiness. Hmm. It seems that that is kind of removed for you guys, because if you're a VR streamer, you'd probably have to be an idiot not to use live at the moment. Um, and once you use it, if you are making, you know, up to seven X the revenue, like you said, you'd have to be crazy to leave uh, until like a, you know, a solid competitor comes along. So right. as a, you know, as a startup, as, as a company, what are your roadblocks? What's, what's stopping you from, you know, your world domination as Dr. Doom? Yeah, um, you're all beneath me, peasants. No, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so 
Good question. I think for us, it's we're 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 still trying to build the best product on the market. Um, we're sort of kind of alone right now. The Facebook has built their own internal solution, and they've also been using Lyft for all their trailers. So like we're sort of working with Facebook and also a little bit against each other. Mm-hmm. Um, but our biggest roadblock is always talent. Um, we we just hired two people. I mentioned to you before the podcast. Both are brilliant. Uh, we're 16 people to date once the last person who's Australian is joining. So we're now across three time zones. So we're going to have to rethink distributed work completely because we're distributed today, but across two time zones. Yeah. Well. Um, but talent's always hard. And then it's really execution. This is why I don't feel concerned at all about sharing this with anyone online or in person about exactly what we're doing and how we're doing it. Because at the end of the day, I think we're going to build it better than anyone. And it just it we know how hard it is to do it and we have some really smart people on the team we've been doing it for a while so i think it's partly that and then there's also we're kind of pegged to the growth of vr not really like we we don't need everyone to wear a vr headset to interact in a stream that's sort of one of our beauties um, but we still need people to care about vr so and we see this by ourselves as vr grows we get more streamers um, so i think that fits really well with our timeline because we're sort of a year out before a beta of the platform and three years out before I would say we're in V1, roughly, if we're going to think about all the features that we want to have in there. And that's a really good timeline for VR too. I think three years when we're going to start seeing sort of 50 million headsets on the market, five years when you and your mother have a VR headset. Um, and and that, that's sort of what we're going to be playing in, if that answers your question. Mm, mm, yeah. So there's there's always this talk about like vr versus ar as well do you do you mm. see them as competitors do you see them as like right right now you're supplementing right you're saying you've got your streamers who are using vr but you've got ar applications like the armor and and you know the bomb and this kind of stuff you can you can chuck onto them so how do you see them coexisting or, or fighting yeah i mean they're so there's such big terms right i think everyone tries to conf- there's like people love to take sides like ar or vr red versus blue and it's just, it's kind of frustrating sometimes because yeah. it's not that black and white um, mm-hmm. Long, long term, like uh, r- before we plug in straight to the head, but way after we have shitty form factor that we are today, I think AR and VR will probably be about the same device. Like you'll wear something really nice and comfortable that has like a VR mode and then has a pass through mode. In other mm-hmm. words, I don't necessarily think this might be the final form factor unless it's a, a, a utility only product. I think it'll be something like a very, very comfortable ski goggle that has great cameras that when you turn them on, it feels like you're just using your real eyes, kind of like pass through an Oculus Quest, but times 10. Mm-hmm. Um, otherwise, one of my favorite quotes by Mark Andreessen from Andreessen Horowitz, they're some of the uh, most well-known investors of VCs in the world. And his th- take was, and it's usually a contrarian take, is he thinks VR is going to be 100 or 1,000 times larger than AR. And the reason he says that is because most people live in shitty places in the world. Like most people don't live in a place like, I'm going to say San Francisco, even though San Francisco has a bunch of issues on its own. I've lived there for many years, but most people don't live in a place where you have access to all this cool stuff. Mm -hmm. And so VR is a great way for those people to take themselves, transport themselves to places where they have more joy or more experiences. Um, Yeah, okay. But besides that, I think AR is largely going to be utilitarian. I want maps, I want recommendations, I want mm-hmm. math help, whatever it is. You know, Things that we do today on the phone is going to be eventually transported to your glasses. Um, mm-hmm. And VR is largely going to be immersion. Im- Im- what's the word? Immersion? Im- uh, immersion. But what is, yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, experiences mm-hmm. that are uh, high on immersion. Uh, games, yeah. movies, uh, interactive experiences. Uh, things like that, even things like memories. I think at some point we're going to see some really interesting like memory mapping uh, apps that allow you to both relive your own memories and maybe even uh, uh, up, not upload like through the brain, but like store your own memories in a way. We're seeing some cool stuff with a company called um, Where Dreams Go. I highly encourage you guys to to check that out. Yeah, well, wow. it sounds uh, sounds pretty Black Mirror esque. <laughs> Yes. Story did, of you, and did you see that uh, very Black Mirror-esque thing? They were using Lyft for it. There's a Korean lady, her daughter had passed away a couple of years ago, and they had reconstructed yeah. the daughter in VR, and now she had to go and like go meet her again, and they were filming it. Yeah. It, was, it was heartbreaking, yeah, but it's very, very Black Mirror. <laughs> yeah, I chose not to watch that video because some of that stuff scares the shit out of me. You know, being someone that works in technology, um, yeah, some of, those, some of those things look like a recipe for disaster, but it was yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah, it was definitely an interesting video. So what's, I mean, what's what's next for you guys? So you, it, it sounds like you've got 
you've got scale there, you know, as a company, obviously you're, you're plugged into multi different levels, but where does the, where does the billion dollar company come from out of this? Are you on that path right now? Do you need to gain more ownership of things? Cause it seems like at the moment you don't necessarily have ownership of anyone. Yeah. Uh, ownership is an interesting question because it's like, it come, it's a gradient, right? Like how much of something or someone do you own? Um, mm -hmm. I think, I think for us, so we're definitely moving towards a platform. We think there is a next generation of live streaming and we don't think it's based on incrementally or even a lot improving the this latency or the stream quality. I think that's already solved. We don't need more pixels or faster pixels. What we mm. need is a different consumption experience. I think that's what we'll provide. If our experiments are indicating anything, um, it is that people want to interact and we can, I believe we can 10X revenue from interactions. Because the interaction we built so far were built in a weekend for a game. It was like mm. super shallow. Um, so so I think I think there is going to be a market for... Live streaming is already big. There's going to be a market for interactive live streaming. I think it's going to be a multi-billion dollar market. Um, dozens of billions of dollars of market, actually. Um, and that's where we're heading. Um, I also think there's something to be said about letting that be sort of the secondary thought. And I hate, no investors hate to hear this. Um, but as long as, again, as long as we focus on providing the most value to streamers um, and developers, I think everything else follows. Uh, in other words, developers will come to us if we have all the streamers. Viewers go wherever the streamers are. And mm -hmm. if streamers are happy, sort of the ecosystem follows. Um, and that's going to be our focus moving forward always. Yeah, well, like, like back to what you were saying before, I want to touch on that again, uh -huh. is um, Mixer and caffeine and such as, you know, position in the market. And, and I think it makes sense to me what you were saying. I, I feel like a lot of the time Mixer's marketing strategy is we're Twitch, but we're not. Um, and, and caffeine seems to be kind of similar as well. And, you know, it goes back to the, the rant that I've had many a time about people trying to launch a new social platform. Like why would people stop using Twitter, Instagram or whatever else to use yours? Um, and, and it makes sense like what, like what you were saying is that, you know, maybe these guys don't provide enough of a point of difference and, and that's where you're trying to do something else, right? So it seems to me that you're trying to capture the, you know, you're trying to capture the hearts and minds of the streamers first because if you look at where the market is right now, you know, it's the large content creators that own everything. You know, they're the ones that Facebook are reportedly paying anywhere from 200K to a million per year to come over, plus signing yeah. bonuses. You know, caffeine yeah. is is fiending for people. You know, YouTube is signing on, you know, Laser Beam and Muse Elk and, you know, Courage JD and, and whoever else. So it seems like the power is in those and, and they have just they just have so much power. I mean, what like Laser Beam out of his out of a bedroom with one manager and one editor who probably gets paid fifty bucks a video, like a lot of them do gets 170 million views per month on YouTube alone, which is more than like most TV channels in Australia. And these TV channels take how many employees do they have? You know, 12 executives. When there's the night news on, there's, you know, kind of two anchors and four reporters and there's 15 people on the cameras and someone's writing a script and holding a teleprompter. And, you know, Josh Dubb, using your example before, does it out of his bedroom being hilarious with a couple of his mates. Um, yeah. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't require those overheads to do so. So, you know, it makes sense to me that you're aligning with those creators and figuring out, you know, your point of difference, what they, what they actually want. And that's, and that's super basic, right? For any startup, it's like, why would someone want to use your company? Well, you need to have a point of difference. Yeah, there's two things to what you're saying that I think are really important. One is, if your last, if if your if your acquisition method is paying for people, then it's a race to the bottom because there's always someone who can pay more eventually. So, mm -hmm. you know, Mixer buying uh, Ninja is a great idea, but if you're not going to do anything with the acquisition, if he's just going to stream, then eventually you're kind of, the, the price is going to keep going up and you're racing to the bottom. So it's a terrible idea, I think. Um, Mixer also had an incredible opportunity to rethink live, live streaming because Mixer came out of Beam.io and Beam.io was all about interactivity. So they should have done what we want to do and they aren't. And it blows my mind every time I think about it because they have Ninja. Like if you build a custom experience around Ninja, you could change how people think about live streaming and get the usage immediately, but they're not. I hope mm -hmm. they're listening because I want someone to do it. Um, the, um, hmm, what was the other thing? What were we just talking about? About the creators owning the market maybe, about the, oh, the yes. overhead of the creators being That's right, that's right. On, the, on, like a, on like a philosophical level, 
I think people yeah. like we we all think about live streaming and live streamers as this incredible thing and it's growing, but I think people still underestimate it. And the perfect example of this is PewDiePie. So I'm from Sweden and PewDiePie is Swedish. That's why I use the example. In Sweden, we have about 10 million people, 9 million officially with, with, with a bit of extra. So that's 10 million people. PewDiePie has 100 million subs. So PewDiePie by objective numbers is 10 times larger than Sweden, right? And I would venture out and say that if PewDiePie was to have a, a nation and he asked people to come out and vote, more people would vote in PewDiePie's nation than people are voting in Sweden or the US proportionally speaking. And so mm. someone like PewDiePie actually has geo, like geopolitical impact, like world impact. He can make things, he can shape people's minds and thoughts. And he ha he definitely has. And that's why he's been in so much, I think, uh, in, so, so, in so many risky situations where he said things as a gamer at home and he's impacted mm. people on world scale. So I think like the future kingmakers – and it's kind of dystopian in a way if it's done poorly, is these people at home who, are, who people are paying attention to. And they're going to have mm -hmm. a lot more say in how people think and what people do than we give them credit for today, even as we are looking at esports and, and, and streaming as this giant thing. I think it's only going to get bigger. It's going to get very nutty in the next 20 years. Yeah, I mean, it's... It's reinforced by things like, say, FaZe Clan, you know, with their first meetup, first public meetup during the Fortnite World Cup. It was 16 city blocks the line was to see them, and the police shut it down. And then a few days later, they did another one in California with, like, one of their craters, I think it was Rug. 3,000, 4,000 kids turned up in, like, 40 degrees Celsius, like 110 degree Fahrenheit heat. Once again, the cops shut it down because they were trying to knock mm -hmm. down the barriers because they were so fanatical. I think you're right. You know, these, these people watch these craters all the time, and I – I love seeing um, behind the eyes, the brain working of senior people, politicians, business people starting to understand that when, you know, I, I went through a period of time talking to a bunch of local politicians here in, in my state um, about gaming and, and saying, hey, there's, there's this massive rival between Melbourne where I am in Sydney, which is in New South Wales up north. There's a massive fight. Sydney has slightly more population. Melbourne's set to overtake them, but the two states hate each other. The two, the two cities hate each other. And trying to say to them, hey, let's get some esports stuff happening in Melbourne. And now we're thankfully the home of esports, so we win, thanks to government support. But you know, talking to this one leader of the opposition party, a guy called Matthew Guy, and I could see it working in his brain when he said, when I was trying to explain to him how large gaming is and how impactful it is on younger audiences. And, and then he started saying, my son plays Minecraft and he wakes up at 6 a.m. every Thursday to watch, I think it was Dan TDM's release. And he goes, maybe that is influential for my kid because otherwise he never wakes up that early. And then every single time that all of his friends come over, they all want to play Minecraft. So maybe Minecraft has some sort of impact on these kids. And it's not just that silly game that they're interested in. It's the new, you know, Mike Tyson, where the whole, you know, world stops to watch him fight even if they don't care about boxing. You know, it's the new space, um, you know, the new moon landing from the from the Apollo, from the US and, and such, where, you know, the whole nation stops to watch the first man walk on the moon. That happens now once a week for these kids, for these adults who are watching these creators. They're standing by for those Monday, Wednesday, Friday releases from PewDiePie or their favourite beauty blogger. They're buying their products. They're following them to events because, it, you know, a way to explain these influences today is is they're, they're almost everything that a movie star isn't. Like a movie star had such an allure because they come out for their one big blockbuster a year, you know, one every two years, and they go off into their mountain with their hundreds of millions of dollars and you never hear from them again except for maybe some sort of TMZ thing. Maybe they've, you know, done something stupid and, and they've been exposed or, they've, God forbid, they've put on three kilos of weight and they're at the right, beach right, right. or something like that. But now it's the opposite. You know, these creators like Jade, who uh, who I know quite well on TikTok, makes like up to seven pieces of content per day across four different platforms. She's on LinkedIn. She's on Twitter. She's doing two to three TikToks, TikTok live streams every day and Instagram stories nonstop because people want that access. But with that access, like you said, comes the influence and the power and, and people start modeling themselves after them. They change their purchasing habits. And, you know, I think it was a really good analogy from you. And we're probably going to cut that into a clip about PewDiePie you know, with his, with his 100 million followers because, you know, as the most subscribed person on the planet on YouTube and, and for a while the largest subscribed channel, you are right. He has some insane power that 
possibly isn't being respected. And, you know, does someone like PewDiePie have as much or more power than a world leader does who's leading a country? Um, probably, you know, with the amount of dollars that someone like this can command now or, you know, let's say 10, 10 years into the future when, you know, you it's it's not uncommon for channels to have 10 to 100 million subscribers. Just like with YouTube today, it seems very common that a channel will have a million subscribers. A million isn't really an achievement anymore. You know, yes, it is an achievement, but on the global scale compared to all the other creators, there's so many channels at 100K or a million, it doesn't mean as much. But what happens when, you know, this more technology adoption happens, India gets more technology, Africa gets more technology, and you've got channels all over the world that have 10 to 100 million subscribers and they're commanding these massive budgets of Fox and such who are getting hundreds of millions of dollars a year in revenue. What happens when that goes to one person? whose face is on a video on YouTube or leaves a new platform every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Yeah, and a good way to think about it is I think you and I are in the generation where we have sort of one foot in each world. We grew up in a world where sort of smartphones weren't the thing. We still had GSM phones. We still mm. went, imagine the same for you. We still went outside to play and we also played games. So we grew up together with yeah. it. And I watch esports religiously and I watch live streams. Like I have a tab open when I work pretty much. That's how I'll, it's my companionship. Um, but my grandfather is a good example. He still listens to the radio. That's his thing. And it's not because the radio is the best shit out there. We know it's not. There's better content. It's richer content. But it's because he is used yeah. to watch, listening to the radio. And so I think as our generation grows up, we're going to see two things. One is we're going to see a wide expansion of the gaming market. Because when I get old, I'm not going to stop playing games. Great entertainment factor for format for me. So we're going to start seeing games expand into the upper echelons, the population pyramid. But then also, similarly, I'm going to continue watching esports when I get old, just like my grandfather watches some sports, you know. And I, th I think that's where it's going to get really nutty when you start seeing live gaming spectatorship go throughout the entire population pyramid. And PewDiePie, someone like PewDiePie goes from 100 to half a billion. I mean, mm -hmm. if you think about it, PewDiePie is a third of the U.S. population, just under. That's crazy. I mm -hmm. guarantee you he gets more votes if he had a, had a, had a vote online. I mean, it's just... It, it gets so nutty once you think about it. And then with great power comes great responsibility. And what happens when someone like PewDiePie turns into Lex Luthor, and now you got Lex Luthor with half a billion people on, on YouTube watching him, and he's telling people all kinds of crazy shit. I, it, it, you know, it, it's going to be an interesting period yeah. coming up. Some people would call that Lex Luthor uh, probably Jake Paul or maybe Point of Poetry. <laughs> <Right. laughs> so maybe they would exist. Right. Maybe right. They would exist with a bit know. less hair. Got to shave yeah, the hair exactly. up. Exactly. But no, it makes sense what you're saying. You know, I, I believe that, you know, our generation is the last generation of non-gamers. You know, I know people who I went to high school with who they love the footy, they love listening to radio and they love watching traditional TV. But you look at the numbers, you know, the old Gen Zs and, and the new, is it Gen X that's after Gen Z? I think something like that. You know, they're not they're not consuming in the same ways anymore. Like you said, you know, they're on their phones all the time. They're consuming YouTube and, you know, talking to some of my friends who have kids, you know, their kids are gobsmacked when they watch traditional TV that there's, they're like, there's ads and I can't skip them. And there's four or five in a row. And, you know, even I'm experiencing that now. My girlfriend's becoming obsessed with Married at First Sight, you know, which is on traditional TV, Channel 7. And I'm like, I get to watch six minutes of content and I have five ads. Like, this is ridiculous. You know, you're not used to that on Twitch. People go bananas when you have to watch a 30-second pre-roll before you can watch a stream for six hours, <laughs> let alone, it. you know, yeah, putting those ads in. So, you know, I think I waffled on a bit, but, you know, I really do think that, you know, our generation is the last generation of non-gamers, like you were saying, and people are changing the ways that they consume this stuff. And what does that power mean? And what do they do with it when you're PewDiePie? And like you said, you got half a billion subscribers potentially in the future. That's crazy. Yeah, and what do we as a platform provider do with it? I think that's the other thing that's happening now is rethinking what Twitter's responsibility and YouTube's responsibility really is. Again, we should not get into that conversation because that is a long conversation. Yeah, that's a can of worms. That's a can of worms. So let me ask you this question then. So people people usually say to me, Chris, who's winning in the market right now? Who's, ma who's making money and who's doing it well? I think for me, the obvious answers are, A, the publishers slash game developers. You know, Epic Games making $3 billion profit last year. You know, Riot um, and and uh, Valve, you know, churning, making money hand over fist. 
and the creators are making a lot of money right now. You know, un unending case studies of a girl selling literally her bathwater as a meme, but making a couple hundred thousand dollars profit out of that. Um, about, you know, creators I know who have seven figure incomes from simply selling limited edition hoodies every few weeks off a couple hundred thousand followers. People like FaZe, you know, bringing five, six thousand kids to a meetup. They're making a lot of money. So what's what's next, or am I am I missing any other categories? And it seems to me like you're saying platforms is is one of the places. Yeah, I think I mean platforms inherently they sort of where the, wherever the eyeballs go, those platforms have a lot of power. The other question is profitability. It's you know it costs a lot to have a platform like YouTube, so you need to make sure it it actually pays yeah. off. Um, but I think you you're spot on the money with terms of the in terms of stakeholders. Um, I think for VR specifically, we'll start seeing. Uh, more traditional publishers and game developers come into the market and try their luck. And also, it's going to be a really good market for indie developers. I think you can get really far as an indie developer in, in VR because the bar is a bit lower. You don't have to make an indie game that's like Noita or something where you know you have to work on it for many years and provide a really excellent experience. Not saying people shouldn't provide excellent experiences, uh, but it's just like people are expecting less and it's an untested market. Um, so you can get away with experimental stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I think companies like Epic are going to continue doing it. I think Fortnite is going to run its seasons or chapters, as they call it, um, and continue building it as a service, as are many of the other games now, sort of turning into services. Mm -hmm. um, and it'll be interesting to see how that, sort of what the next iteration of that is, because that is, a, I would say, a pretty new thing, all things considered. Yeah, and another thing I was thinking about you guys that you offer um, you know, just as, just as you were saying that, you know, a lot of people want to make a company, say an esports team, who's reliant primarily on revenue from sponsorship. And, you know, it makes me feel bad <laughs> anytime someone says that because relying on sponsorship is so fickle. You're really, you're really relying on your relationship with another person. Marketing in this industry is always, or every industry is always the first thing to be cut. You know, when there's a downturn, everyone wants to cut out the spend uh, because a lot of the time sales are... Sales are the golden children because they make the money, but marketing is the devil because they spend the money. So, you know, what happens to YouTube when something like the adpocalypse happens, which which should happen once again, tied to PewDiePie um, in a large way, and, you know, the money starts drying up. It seems that you guys offer another way, I guess, to weather that storm a little bit, an alternate money stream, not only for the creators, but for yourself through this interactivity, through your donations and such. So I, I guess my roundabout question for this is what, what happens to you if YouTube decides to implement, you know, all of the things that you're doing? Can they do it bigger, better, faster than you guys? Uh, or do you think you're safe? Yeah, I don't think they can do it faster or better than us. They just have a lot of tech debt with how sort of you, the YouTube infrastructure is built. Same with Twitch. They have the extensions program, but it's very limited. We know that because we consume their APIs ourselves. Um, so mm. I don't think there's like a tech issue. I think it, they would more look at it as if we want to go, you know, two feet into interactivity, let's think about buying live and then we have a choice of yes or no. Um, so that's not a big of a risk to us, I think. Yeah, we don't look at it that way. I think I think for us, it's we have a really clear idea of what the form factor should be like. Uh, we think we think that we think about it differently. So even if someone was to try and do it, they would it would taste differently if they did it than if we did it. Um, and one of the benefits we have is that we have a really big user base to actually try this on and have them tell us what they think works and doesn't work. So we don't have mm -hmm. to be as serious and sort of foresightful as as some might think because we can just test it. Yeah, yeah. So we've been we've been waffling on for a while now. So I, I want to ask, you know, what's 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 coming up next for you and leave in the short term, in the next three, six, twelve months. Yes, so we have for developers on the in the chat, if there are any, we have a new SDK coming out that's going to drive uh, really meaningful changes to how we do both compositing. Um, so if people don't know, we put real people inside games or avatars inside games. That's how you film yourself. So better compositing and then some uh, some 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 scaffolding for better interactivity. Um, and then this year is all about running experiments on interactivity, really rich experiments on interactivity. So taking our experiments from Beat Saber and turning them into bite-sized experiments, but with the with the richness and the impactfulness that we always have had in mind. Uh, and then lastly is cosmetics. I think we're going to do something that people have never seen before with cosmetics. Um, and it's going to change how people think about cosmetics in the context of a live stream. And it's going to be amazing. And stream is going to make a, excuse my French, but a fuck ton of money. <laughs>
Fantastic, man. Well, you know, I think it's I think it's no secret to you or anyone else that's watching. I, re I really enjoy what you guys are doing. I think you're, you know, I think you're onto a lot of great things here. It it makes sense throughout the whole value chain for people to use your product, and yeah, I can't wait to see what you guys come up with next. Awesome. Thank you for having me on, Chris. I appreciate it. No worries, man. Thank you, and thanks to everyone who's watching either live on Twitch, LinkedIn, or listening to this podcast later. We've got a bunch more people coming from various parts of the industry. So I can't wait to share them with you. Thanks for listening, guys. Bye for now. Bye-bye.